Please put your hands together and warmly welcome Mr. Graham Hancock. <laughs> Thank you, Graham. Thanks. Ah, I've got volume here, have I? Yes. Thank you very much indeed for, for all being here today. I was just uh, listening to what uh, Graham Birdsall was saying about my, my past career, and I was thinking how, how I got into all of this from being a journalist working on The Economist. It actually happened uh, because of repeated visits that I made to Ethiopia. And uh, the claim that Ethiopia makes to possess the lost Ark of the Covenant. This claim was ridiculed by scholars, but as I began to look into it, I found that uh, it rests on very solid foundations, and I ended up writing The Sign and the Seal. And that book, uh, the research on that book, took me to Egypt because, of course, the origins of the Ark of the Covenant lie in Egypt and in the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. And uh, when I went to Egypt and began looking into that civilization, I realized that I was confronted by an extraordinary mystery, a mystery that uh, Egyptologists had never satisfactorily explained, or at any rate, if they tried to, their explanations certainly didn't make sense to me. I remember <coughs> reading a book called Archaic Egypt by Professor Walter Emery, now deceased, but a great authority on his subject. And uh, he drew attention to curious similarities between ancient Sumerian civilization in Mesopotamia and the archaic Egyptian civilization. And uh, while he could find no strong evidence of a direct influence of, of ancient Egypt on Sumer or of Sumer on ancient Egypt, uh, he found that these similarities couldn't be explained away as coincidence. And he, he put forward an, an interesting hypothesis. He asked, what if uh, an earlier an identified civilization, a remote third-party civilization, had influenced both Egypt and Sumer, passed down a legacy to both of them, and what if the similarities between these two cultures were explained by that remote common influence? And I thought, uh, I thought this was a very interesting idea and one worth pursuing further. And in fact, more than anything else, it was that seed planted by Professor Walter Emery that led me to research and write Fingerprints of the Gods. I could not have written that book at all, or indeed developed in the direction that, uh, that I have developed as a writer and researcher if it hadn't been for my partner and, and wife, uh, Santa Faya, whose photographs we're going to be looking at here. She's certainly been the most uh, profound influence on my life. And I did some bad stuff back in the 1980s, which uh, when I look back on it, I regret it, but we have to live with our mistakes, and I'm very grateful to Santa for putting me right. Um, many other people also who I need to thank and without whom fingerprints could not have been written, researchers, people working uh, in the field of the mystery of the origins of civilization over the last hundred years or so, going back as far as Ignatius Donnelly, who wrote Atlantis, the Antediluvian World in the 1880s. Um, more recently, Professor Giorgio de Santillana of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, he's now also deceased, uh, did wonderful work on the astronomical content of ancient myths, the amazing discovery that in some of the oldest myths relating to global cataclysms that uh, have come down to us from remote prehistory, that in those myths is, is found detailed astronomical information relating to the phenomenon that I'll be discussing a little bit during this talk, known as precession of the equinoxes. Professor Charles Hapgood, whose earth crust displacement theory and whose work on ancient maps, uh, again, provides a clue to this lost civilization that exists uh, way back in our past, and I'm quite sure that it does exist. And more recently, Rand and Rose Flemath, who've refined Charles Hapgood's theories of earth crust displacement. And uh, John Anthony West, uh, a great man 
who, who spent 20 years trying to draw the attention of Egyptologists to the erosional features of the Great Sphinx and the implications of that erosion. And of course, my friend and colleague, Robert Boval, uh, with whom I have co-authored the new book, Keeper of Genesis. Uh, Robert's astronomical work on the Orion correlation uh, between the pyramids and the three stars of Orion's belt is, in my view, uh, the single most important breakthrough in this field, uh, which has enabled the pyramids mute for four and a half thousand years to speak again and to speak in a comprehensible manner. I don't propose uh, in, in this talk that I'm going to give on fingerprints today uh, to go uh, at all into the astronomical work that Robert and I present in Keeper of Genesis because Robert will be doing that when he talks about Keeper of Genesis. But uh, take it from me, the, the astronomy is really the key uh, to, this, to this whole mystery. It's, it's a way that some ancient people long ago far more sophisticated and civilized than our historians would ever give credit for, found a way to communicate with the future, a way to wake up dormant memories in all of us, memories of that great golden age of mankind that is recorded in all our ancient myths. I'll start this talk just by looking at a few Similarities, a few connections, bearing in mind what I said about Walter Emery and the theory of a remote third-party civilization. Let's extend that out from uh, just the Middle East, from Egypt and Sumer, and let's look at, uh, at connections between Egypt and the America, and the Americas. Similarities that uh, are ignored by scholars but uh, are not explained by them. One issue concerns the face of the Great Sphinx, which we're, which we're looking at here. Uh, Robert and I are of the view, along with many of our colleagues, that the head of the Sphinx was recarved by the dynastic Egyptians, that the monument is many thousands of years older than uh, the beginning of historic Egyptian civilization, and that it was probably originally lion-headed as well as lion-bodied, uh, and that that heavily eroded, millennially ancient leonine head was recarved into the face of a god by the early pharaohs of Egypt, perhaps at around 2500 BC, uh, when Egyptologists think that the monument was actually created. What I want to draw attention to here is just a small point. Uh, it's pretty clear uh, and well established that we're, we're looking at the face of an African individual here, an African head. And uh, I'd like to compare that with this African head. Uh, which is roughly the same size as the head of the Sphinx. It's an enormous uh, piece of sculpture. Uh, when you stand beside it, it, it uh, towers above you, and it weighs about 40 tons. The only problem with this African head is that it doesn't come from Africa at all. It comes from the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, indeed was disinterred from the oldest archaeological strata in the Gulf of Mexico, in which it had been deliberately buried at around 13 or 1400 BC. We can say that it was buried then because organic material found alongside it has been carbon dated to that period. But I suspect the scholars may be making a mistake when they attribute this so-called Olmec head, the construction, the carving of the head, to that same period of, say, 1400 BC. It's a mistake in logic uh, to assume that the head dates from the same period as the organic material that was buried with it. It's equally possible that it could have been a vastly ancient heirloom, a venerated treasure that was passed down over thousands of years until the time when this mysterious Olmec civilization, the supposed mother culture of Central America, also venerated it and uh, buried it. I'm intrigued by the similarities of features between the face of the Sphinx and the face of this head. And by the way, we know nothing at all about the Olmecs. Not a single Olmec skeleton has ever been found. We, it's just a name that is applied to them. They're one of those mysterious high civilizations of antiquity, the origins of which are quite unknown. 
This also is a, an Olmec artifact, uh, whoever the Olmecs were. And uh, again, just on this theme of light similarities, I'd like to draw attention to the headdress that the figure is wearing and to compare it with this headdress from Egypt. This is a fifth dynasty statue found at Saqqara. And uh, I'm intrigued by the similarity of the headdress because we're looking at uh, cultures that are not supposed to have been in contact at all. Fifth Dynasty Egypt in 2300 BC and, and the Olmecs in 1400 BC or perhaps much earlier than that. So how do such similarities come about? Is it just a coincidence? Was there a contact between these two areas at that time? Or could we be looking at the influence of a remote third party civilization? This, is, uh, this piece of sculpture is from Ushmal in the Yucatan, uh, and it's associated with the Maya. And as you can see, it's a double feline figure, two pumas or, or leonine animals back to back. Again, we find a very similar device in ancient Egyptian iconography, two lions back to back, often joined at the hip. Um, two lion sphinxes back to back, as, as uh, here on this stella that stands between the paws of the sphinx. Let's see if I can get that sharp. They were called the Akeru, the gods of yesterday and today. And uh, this device of placing two felines back to back, again, in my view, is too similar to the device found amongst the Maya to be written off entirely as a coincidence. Here we're looking at a piece of architecture from the, from the uh, Inca area. Let me just try and get this sharp. Ah, it's so difficult for me to see with all these lights on me. Um, what I want to draw attention to here is the way that the block wraps around the corner. This is a supposedly Inca wall just north of Cuzco in Peru. And the blocks form a kind of L shape as they wrap around the corner, an unusual architectural device we find exactly the same method of cornering here in the Vali temple that stands next door to the great Sphinx of Giza. Excuse me, I'll get, I'll get the hang of this in a minute. A method of joining two blocks of stone together. Uh, this uh, photograph was taken at Tiwanaku in Bolivia in the high Andes, and Tiwanaku is a very mysterious city, and I'll be touching on it in a few moments. Uh, what I want to draw attention to here is this imprint of a metal bar, which once joined these two huge blocks of stone together. Of course, the metal bar has long since been removed, vandalized, melted down. But uh, this particular form of architecture is not found anywhere else in the Americas. Uh, but it is found in Egypt. We find it at uh, Philae, at Elephantine, and also uh, here at uh, Dendera in Upper Egypt, the same method of joining stone blocks together. And here we're on the island of uh, Suriki in Bolivia, on Lake Titicaca, looking at a traditional method of boat design. It's one of the few places on Lake Titicaca where these boats are still built, these reed boats with high, curving prows. And uh, according to local tradition, the design of these boats was brought to the Andes by the gods, uh, by the viracochas, as they were called, gods who were remembered as being tall and pale-skinned and bearded, who'd come from across the sea to South America in a time of turmoil and darkness after a great catastrophe, and who had brought with them this kind of boat design and many, many other skills, advanced skills of civilization. I'd like to compare this, this high, proud boat with this design from ancient Egypt, the so-called solar boat of Khufu, which was found buried beside the Great Pyramid of Egypt off the southern face. It's much bigger than the uh, boats on the Andes. But the design is eerily similar. And this design has been studied by marine experts. And what they've concluded is rather interesting. 
they conclude that although the materials used both in the Egyptian boats and in the Andean boats are not suitable for sailing on the open seas, the design that is incorporated in these boats could only have been evolved by a people with a long and solid tradition of oceanic navigation, people who needed boats that could cut through high waves and breakers. And the suggestion is, could this design be a very ancient legacy that was passed down and received both by the Egyptians and by the peoples of the Andes and expressed uh, in the kind of boats that they made. In both areas, such boats are associated with the gods. The ancient Egyptians called their gods the Niteru, and they said that they had come from a land far away to the south, a land called Ta Niteru, across vast expanses of ocean. So whoever they may have been, these gods, above all else, were navigators and seafarers. And navigators and seafarers need maps if they're going to sail around the Earth. Now this map is a modern map, and I picked it up at the Library of Congress in the United States. It's an azimuthal equidistant projection centered near Cairo. And in common with all modern maps, it incorporates a number of advanced features. It incorporates highly accurate longitudes, and particularly relative longitudes, and it incorporates an advanced map projection. It isn't easy to represent a spherical object, the Earth, on a flat piece of paper and to do so with a considerable degree of accuracy. And this is a problem that cartography has had to overcome. So we find good map projections which require advanced mathematics and good relative longitudes. Interestingly enough, there's a category of ancient map which also shows these modern features and which doesn't fit with the received view of the development of human history. One of the most famous of these maps is the Piri Reis map. Um, and I'm showing it uh, here because I want to compare the projection of this map with the projection here centered on Cairo. Notice the west coast of Africa and the east coast of South America. And coming down here to, to the Antarctic Peninsula, tonguing up towards the south of South America. It's uh, that precise projection that we find on this 1513 map. Again, there's the west coast of Africa, the east coast of South America. And coming down here, we find a representation of the northern Antarctic Peninsula. In 1513, when Piri Reis uh, drew the map, Antarctica had not been discovered. Uh, in fact, it wasn't discovered until 1818 by our civilization. Uh, so there immediately is one anomaly on this map. And another anomaly is the uh, mathematics used in the map projection. And a third anomaly is that it incorporates highly accurate relative longitudes. To do longitudes accurately on maps requires a chronometer, a marine chronometer that will keep accurate time at sea. And again, this was something that our civilization couldn't do until the late 18th century. So this map, fragmentary though it is, uh, appears to incorporate many features that are not supposed to have been known about in 1513. Piri Reis explains why in these texts that he wrote on the map. He was a Turkish admiral, and he wrote these texts on the map. And what they say is that the map is not his own work. It's a, it's a work of synthesis. It's based on more than 20 earlier source maps, uh, that he put all these maps together and derived his own map from these. And unfortunately, the source maps that Piri Reis used have not survived. Is it possible that the advanced features of this map uh, originate in those lost source maps, which Piri Reis told us went back in some cases to before the time of Christ and had come from the long lost library of Alexandria in Egypt. Another strange thing about the appearance of Antarctica on this map, uh, it's been studied by US Air Force cartographers and their view uh, is that what we're actually seeing there is the subglacial topography of Antarctica. Antarctica as it looks underneath the ice that now covers it. And this raises the question, how long has Antarctica been covered with the two mile thick 
ice cap that we now presently see on it. Such questions would be irrelevant if there were no other maps in this category. If the Piri Reis map stood alone, the most sensible thing to do would be to dismiss it as a coincidence. But it doesn't stand alone. There's hundreds of other maps that incorporate this same information at a time when our civilization had not yet acquired that information. Uh, this is the Mercator map. Mercator is rather famous for his Mercator projection that still dominates most atlases today. It's a 16th century map, and um, it shows Antarctica 300 years before Antarctica was discovered. And again, it's based on earlier source maps, and again, it incorporates accurate relative longitudes. So also the Orontius Phineas map that we're looking at here, another 16th century map. Mercator includes it in one of his atlases. And here we see Antarctica looking a little bit different with mountains clearly visible along the coast and rivers running down from those mountains in places where great glaciers are known to run today. It looks on this map as though Antarctica is partially deglaciated. The center of the continent appears to be featureless and ice covered, but the coast is showing these unglaciated features. What might that mean? This is a map by Philippe Bouache, uh, an 18th century geographer, still a good hundred years before the discovery of Antarctica. And it shows the continent as a kind of archipelago, two major land masses divided by a clear waterway running between them. I wonder where he got that idea from. There's a redrawing of the Mercator map and the Orontius Phineas map and the Bouache map. And here to the right, based on seismic surveys conducted in International Geophysical Year in 1958, is a view of what Antarctica actually looks like underneath all that ice that now covers it. We're looking at the subglacial landscape of Antarctica here. And while I wouldn't claim for a moment that the Bouache map is a perfectly accurate representation of the subglacial topography of Antarctica. I think it's much too close to the reality uh, to be dismissed entirely. I think that much more research needs to be done into these anomalous early maps and into the source maps that they rely upon for their information because we just may be looking at the faint fingerprints of a lost civilization, of a navigating, seafaring civilization that explored and mapped the entire globe long before what we call history began. The issue of the glaciation of Antarctica is a controversial one, and most scholars would say that it has been covered with ice uh, in the form that we see it today for several millions of years. But there is some contradictory evidence, deep sea cores which bring up uh, soils from the ocean bed, uh, which suggest that rivers carrying fine-grained sediments were indeed running down off the coastline of Antarctica until about 10,000 years ago. Maybe that's the period we should be looking at. Maybe something happened in the world around then that we don't fully understand. And in my view, this whole mystery is intimately connected to the mystery of the last ice age and what an ice age is and why the last ice age came suddenly and traumatically to an end at around 12 or 14,000 years ago. You have ice sheets, six million square miles of ice covering northern Europe, two miles thick as far south as London. You have a similar mass of ice covering much of North America as far south as the Mississippi Delta, almost into the tropics. This ice is stable for 100,000 years. And then suddenly, almost in the blink of an eye, it all melts. Within just 1,000 or 2,000 years, it's all gone. Sea levels have gone up by 400 feet around the world, and hundreds of animal species have been rendered extinct. No complete explanation for why the last ice age came so suddenly and dramatically to an end has ever been offered by orthodox scholarship. There are clear correlations with astronomical events, including, interestingly, the precession of the equinoxes, which I'll be talking about later. Interestingly, because many of the ancient myths of global cataclysm uh, that I've analyzed in Fingerprints of the Gods incorporate precise information on precession. It's almost as though they're trying to tell us 
that there's a connection between precession and the ending of ice ages. And uh, lo and behold, we've known for the last 20 years that there is a connection between precession and the end of ice ages. It's a correlation. We don't know what causes this ending of the ice age. I think that this is the period that should be looked at by scholars. This is the period that deserves much more detailed research than it's had. A period in, in which something awful happened to the Earth, something that brought about a dramatic, tumultuous change. A period in which the face of the Earth was almost literally wiped clean. And a period in which it's perfectly possible, perfectly reasonable to suppose that a high human civilization could have been almost entirely obliterated, leaving only a few survivors and only a few traces of itself for us to wonder at in later times. Hmm. Well, there is the Earth, and that's the extended north pole of the Earth, pointing at the star Polaris in the constellation of Ursa Minori. Let me focus this a bit. That is our pole star in the present time. Because of the phenomenon of precession, which causes the Earth to wobble very, very slowly in a cycle of 25,920 years, the pole star gradually changes. It will not always be Polaris, and it has not always been Polaris. But it's a very slow change, about one degree every 72 years, not noticeable in a human lifetime. It also affects the positions of all the other stars in the star field. And if you can establish that a monument is aligned astronomically or incorporates astronomical symbolism, it's possible to use precession to date that monument. And we think that the ancients who left their fingerprints around the world used the phenomenon of precession as a deliberate way of communicating information about themselves to the future. And I'll be touching on that a little bit in this talk, and Robert will be doing so much more in the talk on Keeper of Genesis that he'll be giving after me. This site, Machu Picchu in Peru, is an extraordinary piece of landscape gardening on a gigantic scale. It's dated by Orthodox archaeology to around uh, 500 years ago. It's possible that it's much older than that. I won't go into the details here, but astronomers have studied the alignments of some of the features of Machu Picchu, and they've concluded that these were laid out thousands and thousands of years earlier than the Orthodox dating of the site. Another aspect that many of these sites have, in addition to intriguing astronomical alignments, is the use of enormous blocks of stone. Uh, we're looking here at a wall in a place called Sacsayhuaman, uh, near Cusco, and the stone that I'm standing beside has been calculated to weigh 361 tons. In layman's terms, that's 500 Ford Sierra motor cars. It really beggars belief that this kind of work could have been done by a primitive people. To put together massive blocks of stone weighing hundreds of tons each to align them to the stars and to join them together in these curious jigsaw puzzle formations requires amazing engineering and architectural skills. And I think that our historians and scholars tend to gloss over the implications of this much too easily. All around the world there are monuments like these, undateable by any objective technique, because you can't, as I said earlier, carbon date stone, which bear the fingerprints of a high technology in remote antiquity, or if not a high technology, at any rate a technology that we do not properly understand today. This is the Altiplano in Bolivia, in the High Andes. And I'm showing this photograph really to indicate how sparsely populated the Altiplano is, how Few people live there at an altitude of more than 12,000 feet above sea level. It's not the kind of terrain that can support a large population. Crops are grown, but they come out of the ground 
stunted and the yield is extremely low. As a result, very few people live on the Altiplano today. And there's a mystery in that and a problem in that, and it's to do with the city of Tiwanaku, which stands on the Altiplano at an altitude of 12,500 feet above sea level. Here's a bit of Tiwanaku. This is the piece of Tiwanaku that's called the Puma, Puma Punku. And it consists of absolutely enormous blocks of stone. I mean, they're just unimaginably large. This piece has been calculated to weigh 400 tons. And I can't understand, I just don't see it within orthodox historical explanation, how at this altitude above sea level, 12,500 feet, where you cannot grow crops to support a large population who could haul those stones into place, and I don't know if 400 ton blocks could be hauled into place by anybody, how this could have been done at that altitude and in that location and why it was done. I think that the city of Tiwanaku is one of the most mysterious sites in the world. In a way, it's the New World equivalent of Giza. It's a site about which there are far more questions than answers and a site about which uh, the dating uh, needs to be seriously re-examined. The dating of Tiwanaku by orthodox archaeologists has for a long time been set at around 500 AD, just about 1500 years ago. Although more recently, there are some archaeologists working in the area who have daringly sought to push that date back. And there are a few who've stuck their neck out and said that Tiwanaku may go back as far as 2000 BC. The difference of opinion amongst the scholars uh, in itself uh, shows how little we know about this site. The conventional view that dates it to 500 AD is based on the classical study by Professor Max Yule, who's always cited as the great authority on Tiwanaku. I was surprised to discover that his influential book on Tiwanaku had been written without him ever having found the need to actually visit the site himself. Another scholar also worked on the site, Professor Arthur Poznanski from La Paz University, and he not only visited Tiwanaku, he lived there. He lived there for the best part of 50 years, and he took very careful measurements of every aspect of the site. And he studied in particular the astronomical alignments of the site. We're looking at one of the Tiwanaku structures, the Kalasa Sia here, uh, photographed in the afternoon with the sun setting towards the west. There's another astronomical phenomenon that can be used for dating monuments, and it's called the obliquity of the ecliptic. The Earth has a tilt. The axis of the Earth is tilted, and this tilt, although not many of us know it, changes very slowly like that. It nods in space in a slow cycle of about 41,000 years. And the effect of the changing obliquity is to cause the sunrise, the position of sunrise at either of the solstices, uh, the longest and shortest days of the year, to change very slowly along the horizon. And if you can establish that uh, certain structures were aligned to a solstitial rising of the sun by a people who normally were extremely accurate in what they did, and if that alignment is out, it's suggestive of an older date for the site. Poznanski, to howls of derision from his fellow scholars, pointed out that the solstitial alignments of certain uh, monuments in Tiwanaku were out. And when he calculated the time when those alignments would have been perfectly exact, he came to around 12,000 years ago. And he suggested daringly that Tiwanaku might be the oldest city in the world, that it might originally have been laid out and aligned to the solstitial risings of the sun 12,000 or more years ago. Of course, his view is not accepted. It's universally ridiculed by our scholars. And yet there are aspects of the Tiwanaku site which strongly support the notion that it's extremely ancient. One of them is this monument, known as the Gateway of the Sun. All these names that are given to structures at Tiwanaku are entirely arbitrary because we know nothing about the people who built Tiwanaku. When the Spanish first arrived in the Andes, they asked the Incas, did you build? these monuments? And the Incas laughed. They said, no way. We didn't build these monuments. These monuments were built thousands of years ago by the gods. Well, such ideas are considered to be whimsy by our scholars, and yet they may not be whimsy.
Let's have a look on the reverse of the gateway of the sun. And what I want to draw attention to here is this feature, this frieze that is carved on the reverse of the gateway of the sun, and this particular aspect of it here. I don't think I'm hallucinating. I think that I'm looking at two large ears, two eyes, a trunk, and two tusks. In other words, I think that I'm looking at the face of some sort of elephant. If I am looking at the face of some sort of elephant, then there's a real problem with the dating of this site, because there have not been any elephant-like creatures in the New World for a very long time. In fact, you have to go back to around 10,000 BC, around 12,000 years ago, to find a creature that fits that bill. And that creature, here's a biological reconstruction drawing of it, was called Cuvieronius. It was one of those great Ice Age mammals that became extinct suddenly and dramatically at the end of the last Ice Age. Could we be looking at a drawing, a carving of, of Cuvieronius done from life long before history began? And here, another ancient piece of stone from Tiwanaku. Very faded, very worn down. But let's trace out this figure that appears on it. There's the two hind legs, the two front legs, the open mouth, the uplifted snout, the ears, the curved back, and the tail of an apparently unidentifiable species of mammal. It doesn't look anything like any animal that runs around in the Andes today. But it does look very like an extinct mammal, and that mammal was called Toxodon. There's a, a biological reconstruction drawing of Toxodon. And uh, Toxodon, like Cuvieronius, became extinct at around 12,000 years ago. And prior to that, had been found plentifully in the area of Tiwanaku. With these kind of carvings and the astronomical dating done by Poznansky, I think there's a prima facie case for a complete re-examination of what Tiwanaku might really be and how old it might be and what it might mean. And uh, there is other evidence that points in that direction as well. We're looking at Lake Titicaca here and at one of those reed boats. And Lake Titicaca today is uh, 12 miles away and 100 feet lower than Tiwanaku. And yet, even orthodox archaeologists agree that Tiwanaku was built originally as a port on the shores of Lake Titicaca. There's massive harbor constructions. Uh, to be found at Tiwanaku, and there's really no doubt that it was built as a port. So the question is, how long does it take a lake like Lake Titicaca to recede in depth by 100 feet and 12 miles away from the edge of the city of Tiwanaku? I discussed this problem with uh, geologists from the British Geological Survey working in that area. Oddly enough, they didn't know about Tiwanaku but uh, they did know about Lake Titicaca. And they told me that that amount of recession of that particular lake would have taken at least 10,000 years. So another science, geology, is pointing to a far greater antiquity for the city of Tiwanaku than is accepted by our scholars today. Finally, from Tiwanaku, I want to draw attention to this figure. It's assumed to be, and it probably is, an image of that legendary god, Viracocha, who came with his demigods, the Viracochas, to South America long, long ago, who's remembered in all those myths. Again, it's a very worn piece of stone, but the goatee beard of this figure, this rather extravagant goatee beard, is quite easy to make out. That's how Viracocha is described in all the legends, a tall, pale-skinned, bearded figure. And his description does not fit in any way the description of the indigenous inhabitants of that region. Indeed, the description of these Viracochas and the memory of them was so strongly held in South America that when the Spanish under Pizarro arrived to loot and rape and destroy the culture of South America, to wipe clean the memory banks of mankind in South America, to our loss, I may add, they were not initially opposed. It was assumed that they were the Viracochas returning. And because the Viracochas had been remembered as good people, bringers of civilization, it was mistakenly assumed 
that these European pirates were also good people. Well, we know now that they were not and that they've cost us dear in what they did in South America, leaving us only fragmentary evidence to go by. Precisely the same problem occurred in Central America, in Mexico. There, there was also a memory of a tall, pale-skinned, bearded god. He was called Quetzalcoatl. He too had come from across the sea in a time of darkness, in a boat that moved by itself without paddles. He too was remembered as a civilization bringer and associated with the ending of a great flood. And in, South America, in Central America, as in South America, the Spanish, in that case under Cortes, were again initially welcomed because they were assumed to be Quetzalcoatl and his demigods returning. This memory of pale, bearded figures who do not look like Central American Indians is reflected in many stone carvings that are found in the earliest archaeological strata of Central America. I'll just show you a few of those bearded faces here from uh, Monte Alban, and uh, here a bearded figure with, with obviously not Central American Indian features uh, from the Olmec area along the Gulf of Mexico. This figure would be dated at least to 1300 BC and may, on the same reasoning as those Olmec heads, be much older than that. Uh, the slide has not dropped there, but never mind. There's another bearded figure, again from, from Monte Alban. And it's in precisely these same ancient archaeological strata that we find these African heads. The presence of African individuals in the oldest strata in Central America and of bearded Caucasian-looking figures in the oldest strata of Central America and the fact that they're together in the same strata uh, cannot be explained by the orthodox theory of history which has Europeans and Africans arriving in Central America at the time of Columbus and not before. This uh, figure is from Chichen Itza in the Yucatan. It's a god called Shakmul. And uh, it's associated with the grisly rites of sacrifice that were practiced uh, throughout much of Central America. The plate that Shakmul is holding across his belly was for the reception of freshly butchered human hearts, and the sacrificial victim would have approached this gruesome figure up a set of stairs here, would have been marched around behind him, placed on an altar in back there, and uh, ritually murdered. I could never come to terms with this memory of human sacrifice in Central America. It seemed so out of, uh, out of accord with the many beautiful and serene aspects of Central American culture. I tried to look into it and to find out why it was that people like the Aztecs were so savage in the sacrifices they conducted. And the Aztecs would routinely sacrifice up to 80,000 people every year. They believed that they were a chosen tribe, that they had a divine mission, and that that mission was to prevent the end of the world. They believed that there had been four previous epochs of the earth that they called the four previous suns and that the last one, four atoll, had been brought to an end by a tremendous earth-destroying deluge. And they believed that we live in the fifth sun or fifth epoch of the earth and that uh, somehow through a strange distorted reasoning they felt that by offering up human blood and hearts to the sun they might prevent or at any rate postpone this prophesied ending of the world in which we live. The practice of human sacrifice in Central America was known as pachi, and pachi means to open the mouth. A high priest and four assistants participated in the ritual. A hard physical blow, of course, was struck to the body of the sacrificial victim. And it was believed that at the moment of death, his soul would rise directly to the heavens and become a star in the sky. Oddly enough, in ancient Egypt, Egypt of the pharaohs, there was also a ceremony called the opening of the mouth. It was part of the funerary rituals of the pharaoh, and it was conducted after his death 
after his body had been mummified. A high priest and four assistants participated. A hard physical blow was struck to the mummified body of the pharaoh. And after the completion of the opening of the mouth ceremony, it was believed that the soul of the pharaoh would rise directly to the heavens and become a star in the sky. Are we looking at just another amazing coincidence here? Or is it possible that an explanation for these eerie similarities can be found in the notion of a remote third party ancestral civilization which influenced both Egypt and its ideas and Central America and its ideas, which passed down a common legacy to both places, a legacy that was perhaps used very differently in both of those places, but which still retained down through thousands of years certain common features, particularly this notion of the opening of the mouth and the stellar destiny of the soul. The Maya who built this monument, this is the pyramid of Quetzalcoatl or, or Kukul Khan as he was known in the Yucatan at Chichen Itza, were an astonishing civilization and perhaps their greatest achievement or it's thought until recently to have been their achievement was their calendar system, the Mayan calendar. But we know now that the Olmecs, those mysterious predecessors of the Maya, used precisely the same calendar. So it's clear that the Maya inherited it from the Olmecs. And is it possible that the Olmecs inherited it from an even earlier and higher civilization, long lost to history? This is a calendar that incorporates a more accurate length of the solar year that we use in our Gregorian calendar today. It's based on precise and extremely careful long-term astronomical observations of the heavens observations that uh, focused, amongst other things, on, on the synodic return of the uh, planet Venus and measured that uh, extremely precisely. It's the work of master astronomers. It's this calendar, the uh, Olmec or Mayan calendar, which most uh, thoroughly enshrines the notion of recurrent destructions of the Earth, that we live in great cycles and that each cycle will sooner or later come to an end and end the world in which we live. And like the Aztecs, the Maya believed that there had been four previous epochs of the earth and that we still live in the fifth epoch, the fifth sun. But unlike the Aztecs, the Maya through their calendar were able to calculate exactly when the fifth epoch of the earth would come to an end. When we translate their calendar into our calendar, we find that they're telling us that all civilization will be ended by a great movement of the Earth on the 23rd of December, 2012 AD. I promise that I'm not running up and down Oxford Street in a sandwich board, crying that the end of the world is nigh. I sincerely hope that the end of the world is not nigh. I would like my children and all our children to have a bright and happy future in this garden of experience that we call the earth and the opportunity to learn and to grow and to face challenges just as we have all done. But I don't think that we should write off the warnings that have come down to us from the past as though they certainly have no meaning because these warnings have come down to us from wise people, people whose origins we really do not understand. And I'd just like to mention in passing that all of these warnings also say something else. They say that the destruction of the world is not entirely an act of God or nature, that in some mysterious manner, we ourselves are always involved in it. We ourselves, through our actions, through our cruelty, through our materialism, play a role in the destruction of our environment. And when I look around the world today at the force of evil that is rampant in the world, the destruction, the murder, the murder of children, the cruelty, the awful things that human beings do to each other using one another, although they're just, as though they're just objects, I can't help getting an eerie shiver of apprehension at that Mayan prophecy that the end of our civilization 
may indeed come before too long. Maybe it's not too late. Maybe we can do something about it. Maybe we can wake up to the spiritual desert that we've created on this planet and look to who and what we really are. And if we're going to do that, I'm convinced we have to go back to the ancient wisdom and listen to the voices of the past and listen to that accumulated experience and knowledge of mankind that we so blithely write off just because we imagine that we're the apex and pinnacle of creation. If civilizations rise and fall, if mankind has climbed more than once to the pinnacle that we've reached today, then all of this is entirely, entirely possible. The people who made this monument had an amazing knowledge of astronomy because this monument is what's called an equinoctial marker. Every year on the spring equinox, the figure of a gigantic feathered serpent is seen to undulate up and down this stairway for a little bit over three hours. It's an illusion of light and shadow, a trick. But it's a trick that is achieved by the precise geodetic positioning of this monument. These were a people who had observed the heavens very, very closely and who had a science of positioning monuments on the ground so that they would signal particular moments of the year. No mean feat and not something that we should regard as the work of primitives. We're looking at the great city of Teotihuacan in Mexico, just 35 miles from Mexico City Airport. Richard Hoagland, in his talk earlier on, referred repeatedly to the importance of latitude 19.5 degrees north. Perhaps it should come as no surprise that Teotihuacan stands on latitude 19.5 degrees north. It's an extraordinary and mysterious place. Very little is known about it. It's thought to be about 2,000 years old. It was already vastly ancient when the Aztecs came across it, overgrown and in ruins. And they, attaching to a thread of ancient tradition, gave it the name Teotihuacan. And Teotihuacan means the place where men became gods. Somehow there's a suggestion that these pyramids, the Pyramid of the Sun here and the Pyramid of the Moon, as they're arbitrarily called, were connected or involved in a process that led to the spiritualization of, of human beings. And hold that thought because precisely the same idea is connected to the pyramids of Egypt, of far off Egypt. Mexican tourists looking down the so-called Way of the Dead from the Pyramid of the Moon at the Pyramid of the Sun in Teotihuacan. The uh, Way of the Dead has recently been uh, researched by archaeoastronomers, and they've concluded that it's a terrestrial diagram of the Milky Way, that it represents the Milky Way on the ground. Also interesting because in the ancient Egyptian system of ideas, as Robert will be explaining in much more detail later, the River Nile was seen as the terrestrial counterpart of the Milky Way, the winding waterway in the sky. And a closer look at the Pyramid of the Sun. Its base is uh, almost identical in length to the base of the Great Pyramid of Egypt, but its height is a little bit shorter. But both monuments have a number of things in common in addition to their pyramidal shape. And uh, what they have most in common is the mathematical value pi. Pi is uh, a little bit over 3.14, and uh, it's the formula that we need to use in order to calculate the circumference of any circle or sphere from its radius. If we know the radius of a circle, all we have to do is multiply it by 2 pi, and we'll get a precise printout of the um, circumference of that circle. In this case, if you take the height of uh, the Pyramid of the Sun and multiply it by 4 pi, you get an exact printout of the perimeter of the base, which is odd because the Central American peoples are not supposed to have had any knowledge of such abstruse mathematical ideas as pi. Pi is attributed by our scholars to the Greeks. The discovery of pi is attributed to the Greeks. And the Central Americans and the Egyptians are not supposed to have had any knowledge of this kind of mathematics. Yet, we find pi incorporated with great precision into the dimensions of the Great Pyramid of Egypt the last surviving wonder of the ancient world, which is at least 
four and a half thousand years old, perhaps older, and uh, which long predates any Greek civilization. Egyptologists don't dispute that pi is found in this monument, and it's found in precisely the ratio that we need to calculate the circumference of a sphere from its radius. If you take the height of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by 2 pi, you get an exact printout of the perimeter of the base. The Egyptological theory on this is that it happened by accident, that the Egyptians or whoever built the pyramid incorporated pi in it by accident. It was just one of those things. And in, in Egyptological theory, it has to be an accident because they cannot accept that the pyramid builders had knowledge of advanced mathematics. I do not think it's an accident, and nor do any of my colleagues working in this field. And one of the reasons that we don't think it's an accident is to do with this phenomenon of precession, the wobble on the axis of the Earth that I've mentioned to you already, uh, which takes place at a very precise rate. I'm going to need to explain this in a little bit of detail. It involves some numbers. When you take the height of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by a particular value, by 43,200, you get an exact printout of the polar radius of the Earth. And when you take the base perimeter of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by that same value, 43,200, you get a printout of the equatorial circumference of the Earth. We think that one of the many functions of this monument was to serve as a mathematical scale model of the northern hemisphere of the Earth. And the reason that we think that is the scale used. This monument, to use one of Richard Hoagland's phrases, knows where it is on the planet. It knows what it is. I'll try and explain why. There are four key moments, astronomically speaking, in the year. The winter solstice, when the north pole of the Earth points most directly away from the sun. The summer solstice, the longest day, when the north pole points most directly towards the sun and the two equinoxes, spring and autumn, when the Earth in its orbit lies broadside on to the Sun. It's an accident of the cosmos that in the plane of the Earth's orbit around the Sun, which astronomers call the ecliptic, but of course at a vast distance away in space, are distributed 12 famous constellations. These are the 12 constellations of the zodiac. And because of this phenomenon of precession, the background constellation against which the sun is seen to rise at dawn on the spring equinox very slowly changes. The Earth reaches this broadside on moment to the sun slightly earlier in its orbit each year. It, it's a difference of one degree every 72 years. The effect of this is that the ruling uh, astronomical sign, the ruling constellation of the zodiac which houses the sun on the spring equinox very slowly changes and it takes 2,160 years exactly for the sun to pass entirely through one sign of the zodiac. That's what the old song about living in the dawning of the age of Aquarius is to do with. Aquarius will soon be housing the sun on the spring equinox as a result of the phenomenon of precession. Now if you take 2,160 and multiply it by 20, you get 43,200 which is the scale used in the pyramid-earth ratio. And we think that it was very deliberately used to signal what this monument is, one of its functions. They wanted to build a monument that was very massive and that no reversion to barbarism could destroy, and which was a mathematical scale model of the northern hemisphere of the Earth. They needed a scale on these criteria somewhere between 1 to 40,000 and 1 to 50,000. And they chose 1 to 43,200 because it's a significant scale, because their mathematical model of the Earth was keyed in to the Earth itself by the scale used, keyed in to the characteristic signature of the Earth, the rate of precession of its axis, 43,200 being connected mathematically to the rate of precession. The intention was that in a future time, an astronomically literate civilization would be able to work out the cleverness that went into the design of this monument. What those ancient pyramid builders did not reckon with 
was that the site would be monopolized for 150 years by a group of intellectual barbarians called Egyptologists who cannot accept under any circumstances that any intelligent behavior of this sort could have been connected to the last surviving wonder of the ancient world. I'm standing on top of the Great Pyramid here, and that means I'm standing on latitude 30. The Great Pyramid stands precisely one-third of the way between the equator and the North Pole. Egyptologists know this, but again, they regard it as an accident. So many accidents are called for by their theory of history that I think it's time we seriously questioned that theory and stopped uh, blindly accepting it. This monument weighs six million tons. Six million tons. And its sides are perfectly oriented to the cardinal directions. The north face of the Great Pyramid faces directly towards the north pole of the Earth. The deviation is just three sixtieths of a single degree. By the way, the deviation of the Meridian Building of the Greenwich Observatory in London is nine sixtieths of a degree. This monument is more precisely aligned to true north than the Greenwich Observatory in London. This monument is the work of master astronomers and master engineers, master surveyors, a work of brilliance and genius, a work that we should all stand before in awe not with any certainties, but with open minds and open hearts. Above all else, Giza is a sacred place. It's a place of mystery and magic, a place that works on the imagination, a place that generates questions to those who do approach it with humility and with an open mind. We're looking at a cross-section of the Great Pyramid here along its meridian axis, north, to south. And as you can see, it's plentifully equipped with shafts and chambers and galleries and narrow corridors. All of these features are engineering marvels. To create this kind of internal structure in a monument on that scale is an unbelievably difficult task. Let's take a quick tour around the Great Pyramid. We'll start by going down the descending corridor, and then I'll take you to the Queen's Chamber and the Grand Gallery, and finally the King's Chamber. But before I do so, I just want to mention a little bit about these four shafts here. Um, the southern shaft of the so-called Queen's Chamber uh, was found in 1993 to have a little door at the end of it. The shaft is eight inches wide and eight inches high, and it was explored with a high-tech robot camera in 1993. And as soon as that door was discovered, the research into the shaft was stopped in a most sinister and extraordinary manner. And at the end of our presentations, Robert and I will be presenting to you uh, the latest information for what is happening concerning that door and also concerning a chamber beneath the Great Sphinx of Egypt. And very disturbing things indeed are happening at Giza today, and we want to tell you about this, but we'll come to that later. Let's take a quick run around the Great Pyramid now. We'll start by going down the descending corridor. The descending corridor is perfectly straight. In fact, it doesn't vary by more than a quarter of an inch from perfectly straight along its entire 350-foot length. It's 3 feet 5 inches high and 3 feet 5 inches wide. And at the bottom of it, we find the subterranean chamber, so-called. Now... Egyptologists have a theory about this chamber, and everything is theory where the Great Pyramid is, is concerned because the monument is uninscribed. There's nothing really in it which tells us what the chambers are for. It's all theory. The Egyptological theory about this uh, subterranean chamber is based on its unfinished appearance, these fins of rock that we find at the western end and, and the generally rough look of it. What they want us to believe is that after quarrying out more than 2,000 tons of rock from that perfectly straight descending corridor and painstakingly removing them from the bedrock under the Great Pyramid and having finally got down here more than 100 feet below the base of the Great Pyramid and having started to carve out this chamber from the bedrock, those whimsical ancient Egyptians at the last minute just changed their minds and decided to go no further because the Egyptological theory is that this was originally intended to be the burial chamber of Khufu, the pharaoh who they think the pyramid was built for. So those 
ancient Egyptian builders, after doing all that incredibly precise work, well, they just changed their minds and they decided to stick the body of the pharaoh somewhere else in the Great Pyramid. Actually, the body of the pharaoh has never been found in the Great Pyramid. The Great Pyramid was found to be completely empty when it was first opened by the Arabs in the ninth century. And we think that this unfinished burial chamber routine is a load, excuse me, a load of bollocks. I mean, it's just absolute nonsense. These people knew exactly what they were doing. Everything they did had a purpose. You stand down in the subterranean chamber, you can hear somebody sing in the king's chamber, 250 feet above you, through all that mass of solid rock. The acoustic effects of this monument are extraordinary. And one thing that our friend John Anthony West has suggested, and I think it's a damn sight better theory than the, the theory of the Egyptologists, is that what they were actually doing with this chamber was tuning the pyramid, that they were tuning its acoustic effects. And when they had extracted precisely the right amount of rock from under the pyramid to hit precisely the right note that they wanted, that's when they stopped. That's why it looks unfinished. It's not unfinished at all. It was fulfilling a plan, a function. And everything about this site is planned as Robert will be explaining in more detail when he comes to discuss our book, Keeper of Genesis. This is the so-called Queen's Chamber. We have to use these phrases, so-called, because all these attributions are arbitrary in this anonymous monument. And there, in the southern wall of the Queen's Chamber, that dark patch is the opening to the southern shaft. And it was into that dark place that ro that, that little robot camera was inserted in 1993. And after a journey of 200 feet, reached that mysterious door that we'll be talking about later. From the Queen's Chamber, we find ourselves in the Grand Gallery. It's 153 feet long and 28 feet high. It's a corbel vault. Each layer of stone is laid a little bit closer to the center line than the layer underneath it. And it bears around it millions of tons of pyramid. Remember, this is a monument that's at least four and a half thousand years old. I'm sure quite a few people in this room have been inside it and have walked up that grand gallery. It can be a little claustrophobic, but one thing you're sure of when you're in there, you're safe. It's not like modern jerry building, where buildings fall down after 30 years. This is a work of architectural grandeur on an amazing scale, of architectural brilliance. To create a monument on this size and scale with a wonderful gallery in the heart of it like this in the middle of an earthquake zone, there was a very bad earthquake there in 1992. It didn't touch the Great Pyramid at all. It caused massive disasters in Cairo, but the pyramids were unhurt by it. So again, we're looking at the work of geniuses when we look at architecture like this. Come to the top of the Grand Gallery, and you find yourself in the so-called King's Chamber, where Egyptologists assume on no evidence that the body of Khufu, that fourth dynasty pharaoh, was buried. We have to allow this chamber to speak for itself, and the way that it speaks is through the language of mathematics. It's a perfect two-by-one rectangle, for example. It's 34 feet, 4 inches in length, and 17 feet, 2 inches in width. The half diagonal of the floor is equivalent exactly to the height of the chamber. So it's a sort of mathematical symphony in solid stone. And the stone used, by the way, is granite which is interesting, because there is no granite in the area of the Giza pyramids. The pyramid, main body of the pyramid is made of local limestone. But the granite came from far away. The nearest granite is 500 miles to the south, and this pink granite came from Aswan in Upper Egypt. There are precisely 100 blocks making up the wall of the king's chamber. And some of those blocks weigh as much as 70 tons each brought 500 miles from the south and then raised to 150 feet above the ground, supposedly by technological primitives. Does it make sense? I don't think it makes sense. Again, we're looking at a work of genius here. Now then, there I am in the supposed sarcophagus of Khufu. I mean no irreverence to Khufu, but I don't think he was ever buried in this supposed sarcophagus. I don't think it's a sarcophagus at all. Robert and I have studied the meaning and the purpose 
of the pyramids in great depth in our new book, Keeper of Genesis. And we think, and there's a great deal of evidence for it, that whatever else they were, these monuments were used by many pharaohs in an amazing initiation ceremony that cultivated the power of knowledge in their minds and the spiritual dimension of their lives. And everything suggests that this plain granite box at the western end of that anonymous chamber high up in the body of the Great Pyramid was the culminating point of this initiation ceremony when the, the pharaoh sought in his mind to go beyond death, to reach out for the life of millions of years that is spoken of in the ancient Egyptian texts. What I actually want to draw attention to here is the way that this box was made. Granite is a very hard stone, as uh, many of us are aware. And anybody who's ever worked stone will know that you cannot cut granite with copper tools. And the ancient Egyptians of the Pyramid Age are supposed to have just become familiar with copper. More interestingly than that, uh, it's become clear that this box and many other granite artifacts like it were not made by using abrasive drills, by using abrasion sand to gradually wear away uh, the granite. They were made with tubular drills, a drill in the form of a tube which cut down into the granite and then the drill core was knocked out with a hammer and then another tubular drill was brought down beside it, another drill core was created, that was knocked out and so on and so forth. The first real study of this was done by a great Egyptologist, Flinders Petrie, at the turn of the century and he found many granite drill cores lying around Giza and at other sites in Egypt and he did a close examination of these drill cores. You can learn a lot from a drill core because the tooth marks of the drill are still embedded in it. And what he learnt really disturbed him because this was a man with a very orthodox conclusion about the origins and nature of Egyptian civilization. And yet he couldn't explain this. When he analyzed the cut marks in those drill cores, he found that these tubular drills had been descending into the granite with a pressure of more than two tons being applied to them from above. Now, how do you do that with copper into granite? How do you apply a two-ton pressure without the whole mechanism buckling and, and failing to do the job? It just can't be explained in the orthodox view of history. A colleague of ours, uh, Chris Dunn, who's a machine toolmaker from Danville Metal Stamp in the United States, has uh, been re-examining these drill cores quite recently. And he's come to an astounding conclusion, which I'll simply report to you without uh, going further than that. His analysis of the cut marks suggests that whatever drills these people were using were cutting into the granite 500 times faster than modern power drills. I prefer the opinion of a machine toolmaker to the opinion of an Egyptologist when it comes to drilling matters, and I think Chris Dunn's views on this deserve further consideration. This is the so-called burial chamber of Menkaura, the uh, third of the supposed three pharaohs who built the three great pyramids at Giza. The pyramid of Menkaura is the smallest of the three great pyramids, although it's still well over 200 feet tall. Um, if we are to follow Egyptological logic, then we must conclude that this chamber was built by a certain B. Wilson. That this is not the pyramid of Menkaura, it's the pyramid of B. Wilson. And the reason that we have to conclude that is because they apply that logic to the single piece of writing that was found inside the Great Pyramid of Egypt. Above the king's chamber, there are four so-called relieving chambers. And in those, some graffiti was found, very crudely daubed graffiti. And some of that graffiti bears the name Khufu, and also another name, Knum Khufu. And like uh, drowning men leaping at straws, Egyptologists have concluded that because that graffiti is there, it means that the Great Pyramid was built by Khufu. I don't think that a little piece of graffiti in a chamber uh, hidden away inside the Great Pyramid is a very solid piece of evidence to attribute such an important monument to a particular pharaoh. As a matter of fact, those graffiti uh, may well have been a forgery. But even if they, by, by the original discoverer, how advised, but even if they aren't forgeries, it's just not enough for us to attribute the monument to Khufu on the basis of such slim evidence. Where B. Wilson wrote his name, uh, we see 
a curved roof. It's a sort of barrel vault. And, and these are granite blocks that form the ceiling, and they were hollowed out from underneath. It doesn't look very prepossessing, but when you get above it, you begin to realize the construction problems that were involved in making this roof. Uh, there I am on the top end of those ceiling beams. This is how they look above. And I want to make clear this is, there's no way that these blocks were lowered down from above because this is an entirely subterranean chamber. And the only way it can be reached is through a long corridor system that finally culminates in the chamber. So all of these blocks were brought in through that long corridor system. They weigh 20 tons each. And as you can see, there's hardly room for me to crouch in the area where they've been placed. There just isn't enough room to position blocks of that size and weight uh, in, in, in the way that we see them there. So again, like it or not, we're looking at the evidence of a building technology that we don't understand. And quite often, when we go to Giza, we pass over, pass by things like this without realizing what they really mean. We're, if I can get it into focus, yeah. We're looking down on the great sphinx of Egypt from the side of the Great Pyramid. The Great Sphinx, as Robert will explain, faces perfectly due east. It's oriented precisely to due east. And it was made by cutting it out of solid bedrock. It's 240 feet long and 70 feet high, and it was carved out of solid bedrock. The core body was isolated by removing this trench of rock around it. And those rocks that were cut away from the core body were then sawn up into blocks, and those blocks were erected in front of the Sphinx in these two so-called temples, the Valley Temple and the Sphinx Temple. They're also entirely anonymous monuments like the Sphinx. And actually, to be honest, we don't really know what their function is. But the interesting thing is the size of the blocks used in making those structures. We're looking at a, a side view of the Valley Temple here. And uh, you can see the problem. These blocks of stone weigh 200 tons each. And there's hundreds of them. And they were put into position at the same time that the Sphinx was made. I'll be briefly outlining later on the geological evidence, uh, which indicates that the Sphinx may be at least 12,000 years old. Since we know that this temple was made at the same time as the Sphinx, if it is 12,000 years old, and the astronomical evidence that Robert will be co covering also corroborates that, then it means that 12,000 years ago, there were people on this planet who had the ability to lift and manipulate 200-ton blocks of stone. And this is a serious problem for the orthodox view of history because 12,000 years ago, we were supposed to have been in an extremely primitive stage, living in caves. There's one other place in Egypt where you find these bare stone anonymous monuments using vast blocks, very similar to those of the Valley Temples. <clears throat> and this is the Osirion in Upper Egypt, near Abydos. It lies at a level 50 feet below surrounding temples. But because there is a temple of Seti I nearby, albeit 50 feet above it, archaeologists have deduced with their characteristic brilliance that this amazing structure must have been made by Seti I. There's no evidence for that. On the contrary, all the evidence suggests that it belongs to the same category as, of architecture as those mysterious temples at Giza, and that it may be as old as they are, that we may be looking at a 12,000-year-old monument here. And that's why it's interesting that it was always called the Osirion. It was associated with Osiris, with the high god Osiris, who the ancient Egyptians remembered as having come to their country in a remote period that they called Zeptepi, the first time thousands of years before history began, bringing the gifts of civilization with him. There are many images of Osiris in Egypt. Here's one that's actually carved in that Seti I temple that I just talked about. And as you can see, he's a conspicuously bearded figure. In fact, Osiris and the symbolism of Osiris has much in common, and I've gone into this in some depth in Fingerprints of the Gods, with the symbolism of Viracocha and of Quetzalcoatl. My bet is, in all these figures, we're looking at memories of the survivors of a great lost civilization who settled in various parts of the world and whose mission was to keep the light of their knowledge burning and to find a way over millennia of barbarism to pass that knowledge down to the future, perhaps even to our own time, perhaps even to us today. <clears throat> 
As I said, Osiris was remembered by the ancient Egyptians as having come in the first time, long before history began. You talk to Egyptologists about uh, Egyptian history, and they will tell you that they know far more, far, far more about the history of Egypt than the ancient Egyptians did themselves. This uh, arrogant uh, statement has been made in print by several Egyptologists, and yet the Egyptological chronology of ancient Egypt is based entirely on ancient Egyptian records, records such as these. This is the king list of Pharaoh Seti I at Abydos, and he's showing his young son, Ramesses II, a list of all the kings of Egypt who'd ruled before their time, together with the lengths of their reigns. And the notion that we have of 30 dynasties of Egyptian pharaohs is based on this king list and on other king lists like these. On the opposite wall, of the same temple is another list, which again is matched by many other lists that the ancient Egyptians passed down. And this is a list of a mysterious group of beings called the Shemsu Hor, the followers of Horus, who were believed by the ancient Egyptians to have ruled in Egypt for thousands of years before the first pharaoh of the first dynasty took the throne. The followers of Horus who retained a memory of the divine origins of their civilization whose mission was to pass that memory down to the future and who were attributed by the ancient Egyptians themselves as the, guardian of the, wisdom, the guardians of the wisdom legacy that ancient Egypt inherited. These references to the first time, to the followers of Horus, to this remote prehistoric period when the gods came to Egypt, are found again and again in the oldest scriptures of mankind, carved on the walls here of a fifth dynasty pyramid, the Pyramid of Unas at Saqqara. These are called the Pyramid Texts, and they were compiled roughly in the epoch of 2500 to 2300 BC. They contain repeated references to this mysterious period the first time. And I'll leave it to Robert uh, in his talk on our book, Keeper of Genesis, to really bring out what the first time means. It's difficult to see in this light, but on the ceiling of this chamber, there are hundreds of stars. And the pyramid texts are full of references to the stars and to the heavens, very precise and very specific references. What we think is that astronomy can be used to arrive at a precise date for the first time, as Robert will be showing you astronomy relating to these monuments on this profoundly astronomically aligned site. This photograph was taken at the winter solstice with the sun overhead the pyramid of Menkaura. And just a little bit on the Sphinx. When we say the word Sphinx, we're actually speaking the ancient Egyptian language because Sphinx is a corruption through Greek of the ancient Egyptian phrase Sheshep Ankh. And Sheshep Ankh means living image, living image. But the question is, whose living image does the Sphinx represent? Egyptologists think they know the answer to this question. And their theory about who the Sphinx represents and about the age of the Sphinx, their opinion on this matter, is falsely presented as fact in all our textbooks and all our encyclopedias. You look up the Sphinx of Egypt in the Encyclopedia Britannica or any other text of that nature, and you'll be told without any question mark over the matter that it was built by the Pharaoh Khafre in his own image in around 2500 BC. And yet, the Great Sphinx, like the pyramids, is an entirely anonymous monument. And since it's carved from raw stone, we have no objective way of dating it. What we're dealing with with that attribution to Khafre is purely and simply Egyptological opinion. And as Robert and I have gone on with our work uh, into Giza and into the monuments of Giza, we have come to trust Egyptological opinion on these matters less and less. In fact, we don't think that the Egyptological opinion on these matters is right at all. We think the Egyptologists have got it totally and utterly wrong. Perhaps you agree with us, perhaps you don't. But one thing is for sure. It's very bad scholarship that the opinion of scholars should be presented as fact when it isn't fact. Let's see what the Egyptological opinion about the identification of the Sphinx really rests on. <laughs>
One thing it rests on is the face of the Sphinx. Egyptologists tell us that this anonymous monument looks like Khafre. And they say that because there are a few statues of Khafre that have survived which actually have Khafre's name on them. And so they compare the face of the Sphinx with the face of a known statue of Khafre, like this one, which is in the Cairo Museum. And they tell us that the two faces are identical. Well, we don't see it that way. We don't think that the two faces look similar at all. We think they look very different. But don't take our word for it. And don't take the word of Egyptologists for it. The person who really is an authority on faces is somebody like a police forensic artist, somebody who's made a lifetime study of the similarities and differences between faces. And back in the early 1990s, colleagues of ours, led by John Anthony West, brought a police forensic artist to Giza, Lieutenant Frank Domingo of the New York Police Department, with 20 years on the force. And he did a very careful point-by-point -point identikit comparison of the face of the Sphinx and the face of Khafre. And here are some of his drawings. What he concluded is that he just couldn't understand why Egyptologists were under the impression that the Sphinx looked like Khafre. He saw no resemblance between the two faces at all. And when he compared key angles of the faces, he concluded, he swore an affidavit to this effect, that uh, whoever the great Sphinx's face represents, it certainly does not represent the face of Khafre. The angles of the face are completely different. And he, in fact, concluded that the Great Sphinx represented an individual of an entirely different race from Khafre. Okay, so that dismisses the facial similarity view that Egyptologists wish to foist on us. What else do they base their attribution of the Sphinx to Khafre on? They tell us that there are certain texts around Giza which say that the Sphinx was built by Khafre. Let's look briefly into this issue. Let's start with a text that was found at Giza which says very definitely that the Sphinx was not built by Khafre. This is the so-called inventory stella, which stands neglected in a corner of the Cairo Museum today. According to Egyptologists, the inventory stella is a work of fiction. It's an ancient Egyptian novel, which we have to ignore. And why do we have to ignore it? The reason we have to ignore it is because it doesn't fit their theory. The inventory stella tells us that the Sphinx was already standing and already remotely ancient when Khufu, the predecessor of Khafre, came to the throne. And if the inventory stella is correct, then the Egyptologist must be wrong, and Khafre could not have built the Sphinx. But, say the Egyptologists, the inventory stella doesn't date from the same period as the Sphinx, and this is true. The inventory stella dates from about 1,200 years after the orthodox dating for the Sphinx. The orthodox dating for the Sphinx is 2,500 BC, and this stella belongs to the period of 1,200 BC, or perhaps a little bit later. Uh, they say, since it's not contemporary with the Sphinx, we don't need to pay attention to it. But yet, with that amazing double standard for which uh, Egyptologists are the, the world uh, leaders, uh, they base their attribution of the Sphinx to Khafre on another piece of text which also is not contemporary with the Sphinx and in which, in fact, dates from the same period as the inventory stella. They base the attribution of the Sphinx to Khafre on this stella, which is called the Dream Stella, uh, and it was put up by Pharaoh Thutmosis IV to commemorate a restoration campaign that he undertook on the Sphinx. And on this stella, amongst many other interesting texts which Robert will review, there is one single syllable, kaf. And because of that single syllable and nothing else, the monument is attributed to Khafre by Egyptologists. They wish us to believe that Thutmosis was telling us that Khafre had built the Sphinx, that he was commemorating the building of the Sphinx by Khafre. He might equally well have been telling us that Khafre was an earlier restorer of the Sphinx or he might not have been referring to Khafre at all, because it's just a single syllable Kaf. So, on such flimsy foundations, perhaps the most important monument of the ancient world has been attributed for the last century or so to a particular pharaoh in a particular epoch. We think that it's vastly, vastly older than that. And I'm not going to go into the details of that. Robert will give all the details in his talk on Keeper of Genesis. But what I will briefly mention is the geology. Between 1991 and 1993, 
The Sphinx was studied by Professor Robert Schock of Boston University, a leading geologist and one of the world's recognized specialists in the weathering of limestone. And uh, he was brought to the site by our colleague John Anthony West, who had noticed these curious erosional features on the side of the Sphinx, and uh, particularly prominently on the trench of bedrock out of which the Sphinx is cut, which obviously was made at the same time as the Sphinx. These undulating, this undulating profile, this scalloped undulating profile, and these vertical fissures that run down through the rock could not have been caused by sand erosion, and they could not have been caused by wind erosion. They could only have been caused by one thing, and that is exposure to a very, very, very long period of heavy rainfall. And Professor Robert Schock has put his reputation on the line, and he's subsequently been endorsed in this matter by hundreds of fellow geologists and opposed by very few when he says that what we're looking at on the Sphinx, these, by the way, are later restoration blocks, what we're looking at on the Sphinx and on the surrounding trench is classic precipitation-induced weathering. The problem is that in 2500 BC, when the Sphinx is supposed to have been built, Egypt was as bone dry as it is today. The climate conditions did not exist then, and they have not existed since, to cause this kind of weathering around the Sphinx. The last time that sufficient rains fell in the eastern Sahara to have caused such weathering, when the Sahara Desert was still green, was around the end of the last ice age, focusing us back again towards that period, that mysterious period when the Ice Age came suddenly to an end around 12,000 years ago. Sooner or later, as you go around the world, as I did, looking at these sites, at the myths, at the monuments, at the memories that have been passed down, at the fingerprints of what becomes more and more real as a great lost civilization, you have to begin to ask yourself, if I'm finding the fingerprints, where is the body? Where is the rest of this civilization? Why do we find so little? And I'm convinced that the answer to this question lies in the cataclysm that brought the last ice age to an end. And as I said earlier, the ending of the last ice age is an enormous geological mystery, and we do not really understand what brought it to an end. But when you have millions of square miles of two-mile-thick ice melting in just a couple of thousand years, you are, by definition, looking at a cataclysm. We live on a planet that revolves around a star. In fact, the Earth is revolving around the sun at 66,600 miles per hour, which means that we've uh, traveled well over 70,000 miles uh, tonight while I've been talking. Uh, if you stand on the equator of the Earth, you're spinning with the rotation of the Earth at 1,000 miles per hour. And our planet is subjected to the gravitational pull of the moon that circles around it and of neighboring planets in the solar system and of the sun itself. With all this massive rotational centrifugal activity, once you become conscious of it, you begin to realize how fragile our environment may really be. And back in the 1950s, a radical theory was proposed to explain the end of the last ice age by Professor Charles Hapgood in the United States. And Hapgood's theory of earth crust displacement was endorsed fully at the time as to its physics by Albert Einstein. The theory has never been accepted by orthodox geologists, and I'm not sure if it's right, but I think it's worth consideration. Broadly, what Hapgood and Einstein were arguing is that from time to time, the entire outer crust of the Earth can move, shift in one piece around the body of the Earth. And when this happens, land that is in cold parts of the planet, close to one or other of the poles, and thus naturally covered by ice, is moved cataclysmically into warmer parts of the planet, and thus naturally melts very, very rapidly. And at the same time, land that's in warm parts of the planet is shifted into colder parts of the planet. And as I said earlier on, the work on Earth crust displacement that Hapgood and Einstein did has subsequently been refined in a very interesting manner by Rand and Rose Flemath in Canada, whose book, When the Sky Fell, I would urge everybody 
uh, to read because it's the most detailed analysis of the Earth crust displacement theory. What this theory offers is an explanation for the sudden ending of the Ice Age. Broadly speaking, it happened, Einstein said, because of the asymmetrical distribution of ice around the poles, the massive buildup of ice at the poles, and all these spinning rotational forces. Sooner or later, a trigger moment is reached, and the processional wobble of the Earth comes into it, which causes all that asymmetrically deposited ice, that massive weight of ice, to exert sufficient thrust on the crust of the Earth to set the whole crust in motion. And such an idea does explain how we lose a whole civilization, indeed how we lose a whole continent on which, on which such a civilization might have grown up. Because according to the Earth crust displacement theory, the continent of Antarctica, which features in all those ancient maps, was not 17,000 years ago where it is today. Prior to the displacement of the crust, it was much further north. Uh, and the Antarctic Peninsula would have been entirely deglaciated and would have offered a comfortable environment for a high civilization to grow up. Then this shifting of the crust, which brings the so-called Ice Age to an end, moves Antarctica dead center onto the Antarctic Circle, and gradually the ice begins to build up over that continent, burying the remains, the body, of that great lost civilization. As I say, I don't know if the Earth crust displacement theory is correct. All I do know is that something awful happened to the Earth at the end of the last ice age. Maybe it isn't Earth crust displacement. Maybe it's some kind of more radical pole flip which involves the whole Earth moving in space. Maybe it's something to do with our cosmic environment. Recent evidence has come out of a giant comet striking the Earth at around that period, at around the 10th millennium BC. And such a comet, uh, scientists are now seriously arguing may have been at the root of the worldwide traditions of deluge and disaster that uh, I review in Fingerprints of the Gods. And, well, if we're not all busy exploring Australia from 599 pounds, many of us uh, might have been aware that an enormous meteor recently whizzed by the Earth at a very close range. Such a meteor, were it to strike our planet, would have the capacity to set in motion a nuclear winter, to end civilization as we know it, to force us all to begin again, those of us who survived. The earliest surviving mention of the lost continent of Atlantis was passed down to us by the Greek philosopher Plato. And Plato got his information, he said in the Timaeus, from Solon, an earlier Greek philosopher. And Solon, in turn, and lawmaker got his return, his information from an Egyptian priest, a priest of Sais in the Delta. And what that priest said, referring to records going back more than 9,000 years before his time, was this. He said that our Earth is periodically visited by a gigantic cataclysm, and that every time this happens, mankind is forced to begin again like children, with no memory of what went before. And I suspect, I really do, that that's what we are. We're a species with amnesia. We're children who've forgotten our own parents. But those parents who were destroyed in that great cataclysm at the end of the last ice age, I'm now certain that some of them did survive and that they settled in places like the High Andes, and most prominently of all, in Giza, where the three great pyramids and the great sphinx stand. And they, Robert and I, are now convinced, found a way to pass down the memory of who they were and of the special, wondrous knowledge that they had to the future. They found a way to wake us up again they created a kind of alarm clock for the planet, a beacon that would draw people towards it, and at the right time, when conditions were right, would wake us up. And when I look around the world today, amidst all the turmoil and killing and disaster, I also see a sign of hope. I see a great awakening of consciousness amongst open-minded people everywhere. I think that ancient beacon is working. I think the message that it has sent down the ages is beginning to come through 
loud and clear. And what Robert and I have tried to do in Keeper of Genesis is get to grips with the beginning of that message. Thank you very much indeed. Mr. Graham Hancock, ladies and gentlemen. Our society today, and uh, speaking broadly of Western industrial society, including, of course, countries that aren't in the West, like Japan, but that are basically attached to a very, a very similar model, values highly a particular kind of consciousness. Our society values alert, problem-solving consciousness, and it devalues all other states of consciousness. Uh, today, if you want to insult somebody, you call them a dreamer. In ancient times, dreaming was considered to be a very positive state of consciousness from which we might learn something of great, of, of, of great value. Uh, any kind of consciousness that is not related to the production or consumption of material goods is stigmatized in our society today. Of course, we accept drunkenness. We allow people some brief respite from the material grind. They may annihilate their consciousness for a few hours with large quantities of alcohol <coughs> and that's perfectly allowed because it doesn't it doesn't really challenge the the basic model that that the only good consciousness is alert problem-solving consciousness um, it's almost seen as a, as a kind of temporary relief from that so that we can come back and be even more alert and problem oriented uh, afterwards um, so a, a society that subscribes to that model uh, is, is a society that is going to condemn uh, states of consciousness that have nothing to do with the alert problem-solving mentality, but have to do with the, the exploration, you know, dare I say it, of non-physical realms. Once we admit the notion of non-physical realms, then our commitment to the physical world uh, and, to, and to physical reality starts to be undermined slightly. And it's easy to see why people in powerful positions in our society would not wish that to happen and would feel, would feel threatened by it. And if you go back to the 1960s when there, when there was you know, a tremendous upsurge of exploration of psychedelics, I would say that the huge backlash that, that followed that had to do with a fear on the part of the powers that be, that if enough people went into those realms and those experiences, the very fabric of the society we have today would be picked apart, and most importantly, those in power at the top would not be in power at the top anymore. Um, and I, think, I personally think that's what the, the so-called war on drugs is all about. Uh, it's all about maintaining uh, the status quo, the hierarchy, the, the power structures of the society that we have today. And I actually do think that if, uh, if, if a much greater number of people uh, had intense experiences in altered states of consciousness, that it would definitely change our society and it would unpick the power structures in our society. Uh, so in a sense, those in positions of power are, are right about that. Their, their, their power base would be, would be threatened. But in terms of the long story of human evolution, this could be the best possible thing. If you look at the disastrous, horrendous state that the world is in today, based entirely on this deification of the alert, problem-solving state of consciousness, uh, you know, maybe it's time we had a, a change, and, and maybe we need powerful plant allies in order, to, in order to make that change. Maybe we don't have the resources just within ourselves uh, in, in, in order to do that. Now, of course, the accepted established religions also have an investment in denying people access to altered states of consciousness. Uh, because the moment that you have uh, direct contact with spirit realms, if that's what they are, uh, that's the moment you don't need the priest anymore. You don't need the church. You don't, you don't need that whole structure because you can explore those experiences for yourself. Now, to my mind, nothing could be more liberating than exploring those experiences for yourself. Uh, we do not need the church. We do not need uh, the structure that, that has been built up over the last 2,000 years. The time has come to, 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 to 
to change that. But I can understand why those who have a vested interest in those power structures feel very threatened by, by altered states. So you wouldn't just have to change the religious framework, you'd have to, you'd have to, you'd have to change the whole ethic of society uh, before such experiences were encouraged and nurtured and valued by society. But it's a circle, circular process because the more people who have those experiences, the more society will change.